Our conversation today is with, um, is with, is with Spencer Dale. Spencer Dale has had an incredibly illustrious career, first as chief economist of the Bank of England. And so he had deep contextual knowledge of both the macroeconomics of handling oil in the British economy um, and of um, uh, being a very senior part of a public agency, a central bank, um, uh, which had to stand up, had a mandate and had to stand up and communicate both with ordinary people and with government about what was uh, fiscally appropriate for, for handling that oil. So that was, um, that was Spencer Dale Mark I, and then Spencer Dale Mark II uh, is as the chief economist for British Petroleum. And in that capacity, um, he is working in a lot of uh, poor countries um, with uh, oil and gas discoveries, um, which have the potential both to be the rocket um, that propels the country into prosperity and out of mass poverty, and equally uh, the potential to crash uh, the society uh, into conflict and disorder. So public policy really matters with natural resources, uh, and we've got nobody better than Spencer Dale to talk about it. So. Spencer, thank you very much for joining us. Um, uh, let's start with your career as the Chief Economist of the Bank of England. Uh, absolutely, and it's a pleasure to join you today, Paul. Um, a key part, so the Bank of England, um, midway through my career, was made independent. And that independence was in the form of what we called instrument independence, not goal independence. So the goal that we were, we were set was set by government, and that was to hit an inflation target. And we were given um, responsibility for setting the instruments of monetary policy, particularly interest rates, in a, in a manner consistent with hitting that inflation target. And the economics of that was because Governments always have an incentive ahead of an election to uh, to try and pump prime the economy to become uh, to get the economy working very successfully just before an election, and so and therefore that will often lead to inflation. And so you give this to an independent central bank. But when you're operating in that world, you're very conscious that um, you're affecting people's lives. We were setting interest rates. We're affecting the cost at which they borrowed their money, the value of their savings, but we weren't. Um, democratically uh, elected. And so we had to think about a system by which we could uh, go about making those policies. And two things were critical in that. One was transparency. And so we spent an, an awful lot of our time and effort explaining what we were trying to achieve, the judgments we, that were leading us to make the decisions we were making, and how we thought those decisions would affect the ultimate outcome, which was to control inflation. There's huge uncertainty associated with those decisions. So at any one point, your decision you make may turn out to be wrong in hindsight. But the key thing was huge amounts of time in terms of transparency, explaining what we were doing. The other second point, which is really important from the word go, is what we called building a constituency for low inflation. So we spent an enormous amount of time working with schools, with companies, with politicians, with, a, with opinion formers, explaining why low and stable inflation was important. And therefore why what the task we were being set by government was a legitimate task. And so those two things together, I think were critical for the role that central bank could play over, over a sustained basis build a constituency widespread public support for what you're trying to do and be very transparent about the judgments you're you're making that underlie your policy decisions do you think that also applies for governments in poor countries um which are discovering oil or gas revenues for the first time um do they also need to try and sort of build uh, both uh agencies that uh, 
are somewhat detached from, from government and um, together with um, uh, those agencies build a constituency that counters the, the pressures for the, the short term, the political business cycle. I think so, because because it's central to, to try to off to try to sort of avoid some of those problems that you are identifying uh, at the beginning in terms of how if you get this enormous wealth, if you spend that wealth uh, poorly, particularly in terms of lots of current consumption spending, that can lead to a very lopsided economy, so-called with the resource curse, with too many resources flowing into one sector, the sector becoming very unbalanced and not broadly based. And so part, I think, for any successful country when dealing with the enormous benefit of a huge of, of, of resources, if you have a suddenly uh, a discovery of resources, is explaining to society why the sensible thing uh, use of that funds is not to go um, to have lots of current consumption, one big party, but instead to start investing in the future, investing in physical infrastructure, roads, uh, energy, health systems, and also in, in, in human infrastructure in terms of education and skills, which allow that, 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 that wealth to generate long-term, sustained, broad-based growth rather than near-term consumption. And to do that, I think both those elements I was talking about are critical. One is you need to explain that to uh, society and build an understanding and widespread understanding and knowledge of that. And moreover, you will often have to take some of the decisions and, and put that in a framework such that politicians can resist the pressure to try to give in, to give, um, to, to go to short term um, boosts. An independent body is one example of that, but clear uh, policy structures with lots of transparency can also give you similar outcomes. What came to mind was a conversation I had uh, in Zambia a few years ago um, with, uh, with some, some ordinary Zambians, and the, 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 not the government, but with just ordinary people. And they said, when the copper runs out, what will our children say about us? Because Zambia at the time had been a classic example of uh, um, when the copper price is high, borrow as much as you possibly can and spend it on a consumption bonanza. Um, and the, the point of that little story is that um, citizens, ordinary citizens, get this much more easily than governments because um, families have children. And the struggle of any uh, decent family is sacrifice uh, the, the adult generation for a better lives for the children. Uh, it's governments that have elections, um, not, uh, not families. Um, so I think it's entirely possible to build that constituency of an informed uh, citizenry. Um, I wanted to turn to a, a different issue which is very much the, the issue of the moment with the relationship between um, oil and gas extraction and, uh, and climate change. And, and again, what is the responsibility of, a, of, a, of an oil and gas company? Um, what is the responsibility of a government that's just discovered oil or gas? Um, and what is the responsibility of the international community? It's a tricky question. And what is clear, I think there are two things I am clear about. One is that the world needs to decarbonize and it needs to decarbonize rapidly, uh, such that not only does it get to a world of close to net zero carbon emissions by 2050, but it makes a sizable reduction in the next 10 or 15 years. But and, and uh, but alongside that, it needs to do that in such a world, uh, in such a way that uh, poorer developing economies can continue to grow and, and prosper. And many of them can then get access to affordable energy in a way they don't have access to that energy today. And so it is important that we solve both of these um, challenges simultaneously and solving just one of them and not the other will not lead to a, a sustainable outcome um, for the world. 
So for, for, for companies like BP, we have a role in helping some developing, uh, developed economies, advanced economies to, to decarbonize and lead the way in developing clean um, uh, energy technologies, um, such as wind and solar was 10 or 15 years ago, hydrogen will be in the future, and we can work with wealthy economies to help develop some of those technologies early. But we can also work with developing economies around the world, uh, and such that if they do discover uh, resources of, of oil and gas, how best to use those resources in a way which brings wealth um, to, and prosperity to their economies, but does so in a way which recognizes that the world will, will is looking to do that in a, in a way of, of with a focus on efficiency, with a focus on reducing the carbon intensity of that energy in, to a far greater extent than would have been the case 10, 15, 20 years ago. So I think the nature of the conversation now is different to the past. It will be, it will also be different in the sense that if those resources, some of those resources are exported and compete on a world stage, that world stage is becoming far more competitive as many, many people try to extract and, and, and produce their resources and in a world where um, oil, the demand for oil, coal and natural gas will start to decline over time. So it's a different, more competitive marketplace. Discoveries of oil and gas have had potentially huge benefits to bring to developing economies, but it has to be seen as part of in the context of this broader debate of both generating energy for these uh, developing economies, but also in, in a manner which is consistent with the world overall decarbonizing over the next 20 or 30 years. Now, the International Energy Association, I think, recently came out with a statement that um, the world had already um, discovered more oil than it could safely burn and more gas than it could safely burn. And so um, there should be no more uh, prospective um, and no new discoveries should be opened up. Um, what do you make of that? Do you think that's an ethical proposition? So the it was the International Energy Agency um, had many different scenarios, and one of them, which was uh, published earlier this year, which you're referring, was their their net zero emissions scenario, which was designed to be, in in their words, a pathway um, to net zero for the energy system, and that included a very very substantial decarbonisation of the energy system over the next ten years. So, so, for example, oil demand fell by around 30% over the next 10 years. That's a very different pathway we're on now, but it's one which was needed to achieve a, a temperature pathway which is consistent with it, um, maintaining temperature rises below one and a half degrees. In that pathway, they pointed out that the existing investing in existing facilities, existing oil and gas facilities, would generate sufficient oil and gas in order uh, uh, that the world needed. Now, but it's still, um, and the, the important point that some people sometimes misunderstand, it didn't say we don't need any investment in oil and gas. You still need huge amounts of investment in oil and gas. They estimate something of the region of $350 billion per year, each year um, uh, over the next 10 years, and then stepping down, um, um, after 2030. So you still need enormous volumes, but that could be done largely in um, existing um, in existing uh, fields. Now, it's quite conceivable that there may be other fields around the world which haven't yet been discovered, which could produce uh, lower cost, lower carbon intensity oil and gas um, than, than the existing fields. And so I think it's tricky to say to, to be too normative from that type of scenario and say any type of exploration uh, it isn't, isn't valid. But I think the challenge it poses is that in a world where the life of hydrocarbons for oil and gas it is finite lived and, 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 the, and the length of that demand could be as short as 20 or 30 years, that colours decisions about exploration in a way which were different to the, to the conversation as, as 
recently as 10 or 20 years ago when it felt like the demand for oil and gas would, would, would last sort of for the foreseeable future. But let, me, let me actually push back on that because I felt that the International Energy Agency uh, idea was, was ethically outrageous um, because it was saying that, um, um, okay, um, uh, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, they've got enough oil and gas, Russia. Um, um, so, uh, so they're the ones who will, uh, with the, the party's over now. Um, um, yeah, um, Senegal, poor country, um, could exploit a new um, oil or gas field, but, but it shouldn't because we've already found enough. Um, and why I think that's ethically outrageous is that um, there are still enormous rents from oil and gas, economic rents. Um, and it's saying that the economic rents um, should belong to these incredibly wealthy places um, uh, and incredibly poor places, which are systematically the least explored in the world, um, should just be out of it permanently. Um, and so it was privileging one criterion, which was efficiency of extraction, as it were, over a much more important criterion, which is who's going to get these rents, these huge economic rents? Um, where should the last barrel of oil come from? Where should the last cubic meter of gas come from? And to my mind, the answer is they should come from the poorest countries on earth and the richest countries should be the ones to close first. So um, there's a closely related uh, set of arguments to the point you're making, which is the increasing emphasis on the importance of a just and an equitable transition and that the burden of the energy transition falls on, on those countries, on, on those uh, groups of society best able to, um, uh, uh, to bear it. Now, so an, an alternative, ex, an alternative um, interpretation of, of, the, of the IA's work Maybe that perhaps it was is less offensive than you suggest, and perhaps it was just incomplete. Because if it then also alongside that said, but some of the revenues associated and the rents associated with this should be um, reallocated to other countries who 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 need to keep their oil and gas in the ground to make sure this is a just and equitable transition, then I think you would perhaps have less moral outrage. Now, the practical mechanisms by which that can come about are very difficult, which is why your instinct is um, we should close down one and, and start another. Now, we know that could be very inefficient. And so if there's another way of doing it, but I think the point you highlight, which is even though the world needs to get to net zero, there are huge potential impacts uh, and costs associated with that. And thinking about the bur how that burden is shared and the importance of just an equitable transition, I think is critically important. And we can see this, um, we're talking to today just at the point where the COP26 uh, UN conference, climate conference has started in Glasgow. One of the critical uh, features of, um, of that COP will be whether the developed world um, meets its obligation to provide or its commitment to provide an annual um, climate finance of $100 billion uh, each year to emerging market economies to help their development. Thus far, the developed economy economies have failed to achieve and hit that pledge. And I think the importance of a just and equitable transition is becoming more and more important and is critical to the, to the long term success. If, if we get those countries which are least able to bear the burden, bearing the biggest burden of the energy transition, then that clearly that will not be a sustainable outcome. Yeah, I mean, my fear is that the powerful countries in the international community will use their power not to provide the many billions 
that need to be transferred to the poorest countries, but will actually use their power to force the uh, closure of uh, prospecting for oil and gas in those poor countries. Spencer, thank you very much indeed. It's been great talking to you. Thank you. It's a pleasure as always, Paul. Thank you.